All right, in this episode, we break down Sandy Koufax's pitching mechanics and why this 19-year-old girl is a better athlete than 95% of baseball. Brent Porcio, Stephen Godon here at the At Top Velocity, hashtag Pitch Your Tips Show, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, musically At Top Velocity, hashtag Pitch Your Tips, baseball tips, hitting tips, ask your question, we'll answer on the show. Uh, camps, camps are still rolling. Um, that's about it. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of phone calls today. It seems like everybody is getting out uh, of their season or has been out of the season or, or is really what it is. It's, it's Thanksgiving break. Everybody's getting off break. They got they got more time in the day. They're thinking about their training. This is good. This is the time to act. I wouldn't wait too long uh, on this because you know what's going to happen is Christmas is going to be right around the corner. Then New Year's is going to hit, and then you're getting ready for your season. So, you know, you, I always tell guys like wow, a month, a two months, not a lot of time. So, more time the better. Give us a call. Come down here. Come to the camps, guys. Stay as long as you can. You know, we've been really pushing guys to stay down here as long as they can to train. We've got a good group. We've got a, got a good group of guys in here. Um, but come on down. It's, this is the time when you got a lot of guys in here because everybody's kind of feeding off each other. Good energy. Everybody's helping each other. Uh, it's pretty awesome. And, you know, this is a comprehensive approach. You're not coming down here to do, you know, stuff you could do in your local gym. You're going to come down here and do stuff that uh, no one's teaching you. No one's coaching you to do well. Um, and we're going to give you the tools and the technology to do it well. And you're gonna learn a ton about yourself. And it's crazy things, we just broke down two guys a day. We, we learned a lot about uh, their hips. We learned a lot about their uh, their force production on the mound, how it's driving, how it's moving. Uh, breaking down biomechanics, as you can watch our, in our 3X biometric analysis. Mm -hmm. Learn a lot about their biomechanics, how, how their body's moving energy up the chain. Um, you're not gonna get that, unfortunately, you're not gonna get that in your local area. So come on down and train with us. All right, let's go. Fun little show today, let's get started. Connor Smallnut asks, can you guys do Sandy Koufax or any old legendary pitcher? It would be really interesting to see how pitching mechanics have changed over time. All right, we'll go with Sandy Koufax. Um, you know, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say he's representative of all mechanics back then. I think he was probably still considered <clears throat> unique at that time, I don't think guys probably had that really dynamic stride that he had, or that big of a stride. I mean, I, I mean, you, you're going to clump them together. You're probably going to clump Seaver, Ryan, you know, Juan Marichal, big striders back then. I, I don't. I would say not all of them were though. Um, but it, it will make a good analysis. So let's break down Sandy. We um, don't have any. I don't have any experience with him. It was cool though. David got to spend some time with him. He actually has his picture on his Twitter backdrop of him talking to Sandy Koufax. Pretty cool that Sandy Koufax is very much involved with the Dodgers still. He work, He likes to go down and work with the pitchers and, and talk to them. I think he likes to talk um, strategies and David pitch was grips saying, and stuff. David was saying too that uh, even the pitching coach was talking in one of his bullpens and relating his mechanics to Sandy Koufax's mechanics at one point and being like yeah. Koufax did that and he was saying that you should do it because Koufax did it. Uh, well, he's a I legend. Think it, yeah, I yeah. think he was talking about um, uh, how he kind of collapsed his knee. You know what I'm talking about? The back leg. Yeah, yeah. the back oh, we'll leg. Look at it. What else we got on? Uh, you know, it's 6'2". Uh, it says he was 6'2", 210 pounds. I was kind of surprised by the uh, um, 210 pounds. Um, we saw something that he never averaged over 93.2 miles per hour on his fastball. Is that what you yeah, said? Yeah, that's what the LA Times said. He hadn't. They don't have him registered over 93.2. That's what I saw. I don't know how accurate that is back. You know, back then they didn't have radar guns. Well, he was a starting right pitcher, so I mean that would make sense. That's an average. It's pretty good. Yeah. Well, ended his career um, in his early 30s. Uh, they diagnosed him with arthritis in his in his throwing elbow, but I. I heard something that the doctor said looking back on it that he probably had uh, a torn ucl and um they just didn't know about that at the time so yep yeah i think everything was arthritis back then i remember hearing that you know it's just like any type of joint pain 
um, chronic, specifically chronic pain would more likely probably be diagnosed with uh, arthritis. Because it, I think that was their way of saying inflammation back then, like uh, poor, poor circulation or inflammation. But yeah, he, more than likely something had happened. I mean, his career ended at 31 years old and it was related to how his um, elbow, his elbow was, was a problem. Um, so that's probably probably would cause it because we know when UCL goes, even if you don't experience pain, which sounds like he had it, mm -hmm. um, you do lose accuracy because you don't have as much joint stability, and you lose ball speed. So that would really affect someone like Sandy Koufax, obviously at that top level. So it's probably too. It's why he still loves to be involved today. When I feel like when someone's career is, is cut short, you you really want to you don't want to give it up, and then you get. You get stuck in the game. Not a bad thing. You get stuck in the game uh, because you you know you still you feel like it wasn't it wasn't fulfilled. You still like you feel like you got more to offer, and I think that's what happens. I mean, I'm speaking from experience. Someone who was injured in the game and feel like he got cut short, even though I came back and got a taste of, of pro ball, I feel like yeah, I got cut short. So that's why I still love being a part of the game and contributing. And I think when you run into guys that have had long, long careers that are really done, you know, that walked away, you know, that retired and was really happy with retirement. Um, they kind of, they they pop up here now, but they, they kind of just fade away in the shadows a little bit because I don't think they have that drive to, to be a part of it anymore when they feel like they contributed so much, you know. So you can you can obviously see that in Kovacs' career. So let's break it down. Let's take him into his leg lift here. Okay, this is probably, probably a warm up pitch, but take him in his leg lift. Big leg lifter, you know, you're going to see, like I said, Ryan, Seaver, Koufax, all kind of feeding off of each other here. So the big lifts, a um, lot of momentum coming out of those lifts. I mean, leads hit with the hip hard. Look, he hooks the rubber. I mean, he's way up on the rubber, which is interesting. I mean, I actually, that's more than I've ever seen. It looks like his whole foot is on the rubber. Yeah. Okay. And then almost a, almost a lift le extended lift leg, kind of holds that lift leg back. You know, look how when he's breaking the hand, the arm's already going way behind the back. Glove side's way closed off. Um, you can almost, you know, you even see an influence like with Tim Lincecum. I see a little Tim Lincecum, which is probably... His dad. His dad was really a big yeah. folk Kofax fan. Yeah, his dad definitely was. Right, so you can see a little bit of that in there as well. So, I mean, this is a pitcher that influenced a lot of careers, which is pretty cool. And then, you know, then this front leg starts to open. You see a little push, a little extension, or just holding down pretty hard. And then just really good late timing with the arm. You can see him cocking the arm as he's just about to land. He's starting to push off too. You see that him trying to push off the rubber and he hits front foot right there and he's off the rubber. I mean, it's, it's really, really insanely dynamic. Like really just big lift leg, you know, very linear back leg pushes the hips extremely far out and then is able to get it almost full extension and drive uh, into front foot. It just shows he was he was obviously a very good athlete because you know these guys weren't lifting to build that kind of strength. I mean still right here, I mean as he's just touching down, that leg is still not through. I think, I believe, I know if he had more leg power that would have gotten through harder and then more than likely that could have been linked to his his injuries. His injuries could have been just linked to not getting enough force off the backside. So if you have a big front side and the front door swings wide open and you do a great job of closing all this off, it creates that catch up effect where if your momentum isn't going to launch your trunk forward, then you're gonna try to pull glove side or, or pull through your, your, your trunk and it can create arm drag and then it can force your arm to also pull through and it becomes inefficient. It's almost kind of like Dylan Baker yesterday. Like yeah. same kind of deal landing uh, you know, a good front leg position, but just wasn't driving the hip completely through. And been way back here. I mean, look how much horizontal abduction um, behind the head. And then, you know, he's not pulling as, as I would say, as aggressively as, as Baker. Yeah, doing, yeah. Not in extreme tilts, because you can see he's probably in a good contralateral tilt. That arm abducts well, but it's already starting to internally rotate when, he, when his shoulders square up, which tells me that his there wasn't a lot of momentum to create kind of that late uh, release of the arm and doesn't even look like a lot of forward trunk tilt. I mean, ma maximum external rotation, high velocity pitchers, you know, good high velocity pitchers about 55. I'd say he's not all the way at 55. He looks a little vertical there, 
But then look, he gets his front leg to drive in the pitch release. And I see right there, I see a little forced pull down of the arm. Because normally I would see uh, good internal rotation or a lot of internal rotation. Uh, so it looks like he's trying to pull down the arm. Because you don't really see for external to intro arm. But at the same time too, he, he went a little early into internal. He might not have had a lot of shoulder rotation. So he could have had, didn't have great shoulder rotation, which could have forced, you know, more torques into the elbow. So typically when I, I feel like, don't have a lot of tests on this, but when I see pitchers that don't have a lot of shoulder rotation, then where there needs to be, you know, where the arm would like to lay back more, just in reacting to the forces going forward, if it can't, then the elbow gets, has, has to handle all that torque. And that's where a lot of his injuries were. So, I don't know. Looks like there might be a pull down. Looks like there just might be some uh, lack of shoulder mobility for him. But, I mean, he, he stayed in a good contralateral position. Didn't keep trying to pull off and swing off. So, there's a decent amount of momentum. I think he just was left with not enough leg power for that big movement and as hard as he was throwing. So, I, I truly believe if, if he could have gotten more leg power, uh, more force off that back leg more separation as well because look when that hip gets through right here I mean this is the moment the hip gets through right there or let's say right here you know the hip to shoulder separation is, is average to below average so if if that leg had gotten off quicker more explosive created more separation and then got more forward trunk tilts just basically more energy more momentum that, that would have probably relieved a lot of stress to his elbow and allowed him to to play longer in this game anything you want to add? I mean yeah just you can tell what kind of hip mobility this guy had, just crazy hip mobility to be able to get that far of a stride um, all the way out there and land in that type of position because that's, that's really hard to do. But when you compare him, let's compare him to Tim Lincecum here. Like really, Tim Lincecum did get a lot of his, his dad got a lot of his pitching mechanics from Sandy Koufax. He really studied him. Um, and you know, going back to driving off the back leg, reducing the stress on the arm. If you look at Tim Lincecum, not only was Tim Lincecum a smaller athlete, but especially coming up um, earlier in his career, he was so explosive off that back leg that his hip would shoot all the way through even before he even landed on front foot strike. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like he'd literally drive, oh, yeah. Crazy. his hips would be through and his arm would be back here and then he would land and he's throwing upper 90s and but hasn't had any and smaller than him. Oh, that's why I said a smaller athlete oh, yeah, yeah. exactly and uh, you know didn't have hasn't had any arm significant arm injuries or anything like that but really what ended up breaking down was that hip because he was driving so much force uh, you know through that hip and he even talks about in one of his articles uh, in one of his interviews that he was saying uh, You know, I, that's why I had to get hip surgery I couldn't feel the transfer of energy from the ground all the way up to my arm because it was getting blocked in my hip That's why he wanted to get hip surgery. So I mean going back to him like Definitely if he if he had more of that approach where he was driving that back leg through where he could get that hip to come all the way through and transfer the energy up the chain um more efficiently it probably could have taken a lot of stress off his arm and allowed him to have a longer career but I mean just the career that that he had and the amount of time that he had was incredible in itself I mean truly one of the great pitchers I mean uh, of all time I, um, I to, I, we had it pulled up I don't want to start yeah, dropping stats, stats in I think he had like five no, I'm gonna take a guess could be wrong I think it was four I'm gonna guess five no hitters mm. I think you know Nolan Ryan was really chasing him in his career with the, with no hitters, but Nolan Ryan played about twice as long. So <laughs> Nolan Ryan's, you know, no hitters, uh, you know, were over a lot longer career. So it just that's what I think shows it alone. He won three Cy Young awards. awards. Um, he was a uh, won the National League Triple Crown, National League wins and strikeouts, uh, led the league in wins, strikeouts, and ERA. Uh, Four no hitters, and he was the eighth pitcher okay. to per pitch a perfect game. So, four no hitters. And he was the eighth pitcher. Eighth pitcher to pitch God, uh, a crazy. perfect game. Isn't that insane? The eighth pitcher at that time. That's in the '60s. Baseball had been been going on since the 18, late 1800s, and only eight guys at that time. And just la was it last year we had two perfect games? I don't know, Brett. <laughs> oh, we're going in some states. It's crazy. Just crazy how perfect games have exploded. Um, yeah, so it's imp it's impressive. Like you said, insane amount of 
success in a 12 year career was it 12 years um yeah, we're not <laughs> we're not <laughs> we're not retaining statistics really yeah, well. He pitched, right he now. pitched twelve seasons. Right. Yes, I'm usually the one who can't retain it. He's struggling. Come on, it's just it must be late. Is that what it is? We got to go lift. Let's go lift. Yeah, I'm, I'm All right, well, cool. That was good. Um, it's always good looking at the originals, um, and it's cool to see similarities with pitchers today to those guys, which really were the ones that have inspired a lot of the pitchers today. Yeah, so. absolutely. Next question. Freddie Plantana asked. What do you think about high school coaches letting pitchers go CG 80 plus pitches in fall slash winter games? Good question. You know, I would, I want to quickly jump and say that is just shows you that coaches are obviously more focused on their careers than their players uh, careers, which is unfortunate, I, but I'm not going to say that is always the case. You know, the problem is think about fall and winter games. Who's playing fall and winter games? Southerners. I, I, I believe most West, Southerners. Western. Well, any any warm climates yeah. are playing that. So, and at the same time too, you're in a year-round location. So you're right. That that implies that that is an off season, and you're throwing as many pitches in an in season. And we all know ASMI studies that show eight pit throwing eight months out of the year or more makes you five times more susceptible to injury. Throwing while fatigued, thirty-six times more susceptible to injury. So that coach is putting you in harm's way uh, and also making it very um, easy for you to pitch more than eight months of the year. Uh, high stress. So it's reckless, unfortunately, and but at the same time too, it's a lot of coaches that probably don't know any better. Um, I don't know why they don't know any better, but I, I'll give them that excuse. They should know better um, and, it, and it's not good. now. Of course, there's some pitchers that can handle, say, 80 plus pitchers, um, maybe all year long, and there's some that can't. So I think a lot of people, you know, are going to come on me saying that, well, one of a pitcher has great biomechanics, yada yada. Okay, whatever. But the point is, man, why? Why ultimately this is in high school or in travel ball? Why do you need to play that much when, you know, I, I don't know. I, I didn't. This is just me. I enjoyed having seasonal play. I think I got burned out of anything doing it all year long. Um, so, and I wanted to throw my most pitches in my, you know, my high school seasons because I, I love the school pride. And so when I looked at enjoying the game, it was for a school, it was for, a, or a well-known team, a well-known travel team. It wasn't just to get innings in. I didn't really find that much fun of it unless hanging around with the guys. And I definitely didn't want to to, to you know, blow it all and leave it all out there in those games when I was really looking for the potential to play professional baseball one day or D1 baseball one day. If, if I wanted to, say, save it for those games, yeah, that's the last thing I want is throwing 80 plus pitches in some fall games. So I think that almost takes the fun out of it too. It takes uh, the potential of you playing your dreams or reaching your dreams one day. So yeah, it just, guys, it's to me, it's reckless, and you need to get involved. As much as I, I was it, I was out there. I throw 100. I threw 140 pitches against the Australian national team in Europe, and I had to pitch like three days later for the pro team that I was playing for in Europe. And I knew it was going to hurt me, but I was having so much fun and was in an international tournament. I knew it was a great experience. I was willing to do that, but I never would have done that in like some amateur pickup league. No one had to play three days later, and I would have gone up to the coach, even though I'm throwing a perfect game, and I'll say, "Look." I know this is great, but you know I've got a pitch in three days, or, or 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 I've got a big season this year that I want to be prepared for. This I don't need to be doing this right now. I would have definitely said that. I don't think I was as good at it as I'd like to be. And I was that kind of kid that just did whatever the coach said, and that hurt me because I had rotator cuff surgery at 18. But I think that's my advice to you. If, unless this is a game you just are so excited to be involved in, and, and you're having a blast, and this is why you play the game let it ride but if not if if you really feel like your better years are to come and you're looking forward to a big season this year uh, i would step up to the coach and say coach i'm done i need to come out man this is too much well, i mean a lot of high school mm, teams i expect like when i and i when i was playing high school ball you had to play uh fall ball and, and winter ball with the team or you weren't going to make the varsity i still team. would tell a coach that's too many pitches i know i, I understand it. it's just it puts people in a tough place because i mean that's what um you know that's the line that the coach wants you it doesn't to do. put them in tough 
place. He's got other pitchers if on the you, bench. What do you mean? If He's you got other pitchers on the bench. But then you don't make the team if you didn't play fall ball and well, I'm sorry. Ball? If, I, if I don't make you know the team. I mean? that's, but if that's I don't, what I'm saying. But if you don't make the team because a coach wants you to pitch 80 pitches in the fall, which means you're playing, pitching too much for the full year, then don't make the team. Because that's a team you don't want to be on. Because that's a team just like me that could have blown your, torn your rotator cuff. I mean, if I had to do it again, I would have gone and never played the summer before my college season but when I tore my rotator cuff. Um, and, and that was probably me playing Legion Ball the year. I forgot what I did. I was, but I was out of high school. I shouldn't, there was nothing to please. I was probably just trying to get another opportunity. I mean, that, those are, that was tough for me. But if I was, if I was going into, say, a sophomore year and, and I felt like I was going to get drafted that year and, and I'm in the fall and I really know I'm going to get drafted, I'm set up, and the coach wants me to pitch all to the fall, I'd probably say, no. I was like, coach, I'm going to get drafted this year. I don't need to pitch this much because I'm going to go into pro ball and I'm, I'm going to be throwing way past you guys. Why am I pitching now, coach? Because I'm gonna have to go. I'm gonna go to rookie ball and pitch when y'all are out of season. I mean, point is, it comes a point in your career where you might be in that situation and you got to put your foot down. If you're a good pitcher, if you're a crappy pitcher, I understand it. But at the same time, too, is throwing more gonna make you better? You you might as, you, you might go up to that coach and be like, coach, you know, I'm sorry. I know you're gonna like this. You can put me on the bench. Uh, I don't need this. Uh, I need to get better here, here, and here. And this this isn't gonna do it for me. You know, that might burn every bridge with that coach. Maybe you gotta go find another team. I mean, I don't know how many guys I've had come through here that that have gone to other schools and blown up. They were at the current school, coach wouldn't play them. They came in here, we went, you know, 80s to 90s. They went to another school, and then they're like in their hall of fame at this point. And if they would have stayed at that school and came in here and worked and walked away from their fall season, their summer season, that coach never played them again. Nothing would have happened. You got to do what you got to do. But. Well, it's also just the type, the age is, is when you're in high school, it's just such a huge age for you to be getting into a strength and conditioning program and start developing yourself as an athlete. And if you're playing fall ball and winter ball and just playing baseball year round and not developing yourself, then you, you're you just are, setting yourself you, up for injury. Yeah, you're you're setting yourself up for injury, and you're, and you're hurting your development as a player because if you were to be able to take that that fall, I mean the winter you can use as your preseason, you can start getting ready for um, uh, the season. But I still wouldn't be doing 80 pitch games. That's when you start um, throwing bullpens or or throwing two innings in a game uh, and, and getting yourself right. But not 80 pitches in a game, and then the fall time is is. Man, you should be in the weight room. You should be um, developing your athleticism, working on your mobility, gaining weight, um, developing yourself as an athlete. Because if you go to any of these guys who are here training now and you ask them what's one thing that they would have wanted to do differently, they would have wanted to start this earlier. Everybody. Like, I'm going back to myself, I wish I had lifted my, lifted my butt off when I was in... Um, when I was in high school, man, because that's such a critical age when your hormones are going crazy and you're just, uh, you can get in the weight room and start developing and you can make some really big changes to yourself uh, as an athlete and it pays dividends down the road. Yeah, because I, tell, I use this in camp and, and I've talked about Maddie before. This is Maddie Rogers at 19 years old, okay? Clean, she's 150 pounds, 5'9". She clean and jerks 300 pounds here, boys. 300 pounds and she's 19. She's okay? hot. And she's a, she's a beautiful girl. She's a babe. Look at this. Okay. 300 pounds, or almost 300 pound clean and jerk. Okay. That's the American women's record in her weight class. And she's 19. The, well, the point is, if you keep playing all year long, you're gonna be 18 years old, you're gonna walk into my camp and go, why am I throwing 71 miles an hour? And then I'm gonna take you out and you're gonna have a stroke. You're, you're not, you can't even put the bar over your head and squat. You're gonna jump 22 inch vertical jump, seven foot yeah. broad jump, you're running a, a 185, terrible hip mobility. And you're asking me, why at 18 can I throw harder than 71 or 81 and so therefore I'm not gonna get a chance to play college baseball? It's because where you are at 18, there's a 19 year old girl that's more, 10 times stronger than you are, 100 times stronger than you are, okay? You, how did you get here? How did you literally feminize yourself 
at 18 years old to a place to where there, there's a girl that is more, more of a man than you. And that's almost 75% of the 18 year olds that walk in here. Because you're, you've been playing all season long and not developing yourself. This, 75%? There's a handful of guys that have broken 300 on just a clean in here. You know? Like, what? Like, right, no one, no four, one, four no one is. Who have bro broke 300 right, this pounds. Is, this is there. over two times their body weight, almost. No one has ever come in here and done this. She's 150 pounds. The guys who've bo broken 300 pounds are, two are all 15 at, at yeah. lowest. So. So the point is, is think about how this is this worked. This is freakish to see this today because 10 years ago, 50 years ago, women were told that they couldn't be 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 athletes. They couldn't lift. They couldn't do stuff like this. So they were being suppressed. They weren't allowed to do this. They kept them in female things. Now look what's happening. Now she's stronger than every single baseball player that's ever walked in here. Okay, the same thing is happening to you where you are in baseball. Baseball's told you, you can't lift. You can't do stuff like this. It's gonna hurt you. We're gonna play more games. We're not gonna right. go hit the way. We're not gonna develop ourselves. You just need to throw that none of this matters. Now what happens is, is you're 18 and you're weaker than probably every woman in the yeah. sport. Every woman in the sport at your age could dominate you in strength, speed, and power, and mobility. And you wanna play college baseball and professional baseball, baseball. Yeah. and you want to throw 95 and you've you've let it come to this where females now are stronger faster and more explosive than you in your teenage and years. then you're but also too and the point i was making before is then now you're coming in and you're 18 and it, it, to get to you know a level of elite athleticism where you're able to um you know getting close to those numbers is going to take you However, you know, it could potentially, depending where you're at, could potentially take you years to get there that you could have started this when you were 14 as a freshman and developed this base by the time you were 18, you know, and be so much better off. Like now you're starting at 18 with no base, you're way behind, and then you're going... And you got to do this in yeah, four months. Yeah, you go, I've got, a, I've got a time limit. Yeah, I got, you know what, I've got to be throwing this hard and, and exactly, in four months. So what can you do for me? You know, like... It's really putting yourself in a hard place. Yeah, it, it's just unfortunate that it's come to this, that baseball's set you up for this. It was me, 18. I was a weakling, I was nothing to her. I could, I could barely have racked her weights, okay? And once the injury happened, it changed my mindset. It made me realize baseball had kept me down. It had kept me down as a healthy, athlete and it's still doing it today to almost every you know 13 through 18 year old that are not being allowed to train and develop themselves athletically which makes them healthier and gives them an at least an an opportunity of potential to to play at the next level and just at that age you don't con like you you have no concept of time you think you're going to be young forever but everybody has a clock and your clock is ticking you don't waste your time just following the averages of long toss, uh, weighted balls. Let's pitch year round. Don't follow the averages. Your your time isn't going to be there forever. You like you have time to develop it. Start now. Start building now. And it, I'm telling you, it'll pay dividends down the road. You're going to be so much better off when you've been lifting from a freshman all the way through your senior year of high school, and you look back and you've built this base of power and watch what it does to you on the baseball field. I, I, you go to any guy in here and if you ask them if they could have do, done that, they would have said a hundred million percent, I would, have, I would have done that. I would have become as big a beast as I could have become and, and, and worked my butt off from freshman year to senior year. The most common thing we hear in camp when we have guys that have been here for a while is they say to the young kids when they come in, I wish I would have started this at your at age. your age or younger right obviously younger when they're looking at the 18 year olds they're gonna say younger when they're looking at the 15 year olds they're saying I wish I would have started at your age. yeah I mean it's not to say that the older guys can't develop it's just it's time guys it you don't know how much time it's gonna take for you to get to the level you need to be at and it everybody's different so 
start as soon as you can and you're going to be so much better off because you're going to be in a way better place uh, by the time you're 17, 18 years old um, coming in. Cool. All right. hope that helps. <laughs> And uh, good question. If you have a question, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Musical.ly, at Top Velocity, hashtag yeah. Pitch Tips, hashtag Baseball Tips, hashtag Lifting Tips. We'll see you on the next episode.